But in the get back culture, it's like, oh, I ain't communicating. I'm going to tell you what you're not doing. And then what does that lead to? Just a cycle of toxic relationships. Because number one, you're never dealing with the issues that could be keeping you from being with the person you want or deserve. Mm -hmm. And then number two, you're, you're making excuses and you're not like accepting things that can actually make you better as a person. When you allow your significant other or your spouse to say what they need to say, if you accept it, instead of being defensive or reflective, you unarm the conversation. That's true. That's true. You know, because now they said what they had to say and because they ready. They, they, ready. they, yeah. load. they, they yeah. you know, they, they know what they can say about you. And if you accept it and you're like, you know what, that's the area I need to tighten up in. That's the area that I need to do better in. I'm sorry. They oh, stuck yeah. there like, Right. Well, <laughs> What's up, Brave Hearts community? This is Sean Heineman, your premier pre-engagement coach, back with another segment of a scary Terry Mary wanting you to love fearlessly. Today, I have a special guest with us. And the cool thing about today's guest is I've seen her on TV before. So to actually enter interview her is like, oh, this is like I'm excited. So anyway. Let me introduce you to today's guest. Today's guest is a relationship strategist. She's a keynote speaker and author. I want to talk about her book as well. Uh, we'll talk about that. And also, she's been featured on ABC, CBS, NBC, and the New York Times, helping you discover your practical path to love, brave arts community. Let's show some love to Elizabeth Overstreet. How are you doing this evening? I'm good, Sean. Thank you uh, for having me on the show. Look, I, you hype me up so much. I feel like I have a little pressure on me to make sure that people, when they're tuning in, really get some valuable information out here. So I gotta, I'm, I'm gonna up my game tonight, uh, so people walk away and feel like they are learning something new or something that could be helpful to their relationships. But thanks for having me on. Oh, for for sure. I want to speak to you. Uh, there's some specific topics, but I wanted to speak to you about this this thing called fubbing is it fubbing yes it's fubbing like p-h-u-b-b-i-n-g <laughs> um, so it is interesting it's a term that's been out there for a little bit but I you know thought it was worth talking about again and it's really when we allow ourselves to be so distracted by our technology that that overtakes our time so sometimes you see people literally in bed together but looking at their phones and not really communicating with each other or you're out at a restaurant or you're, you know, you with your significant other or even your kids. It could be any kind of relationship, romantic or non-romantic, and you're more consumed with the social media that's in front of you. And I'm raising my hand because I've been guilty of this. You know, the world we live in, we have to stay <laughs> attuned to what's happening with relationships and things of that nature. Plus we get into the entertainment just like anyone else. We like a good laugh and some mindless entertainment. But I think the balance is like, not allowing that phone to take the place of spending quality time and still interacting with, you know, your significant other or spouse. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I, I think I've heard it before, but once I saw your video, I was like, we just have to talk about this in depth a little bit because I know I'm guilty of it. And, and as a creator, you know, I'm always searching for content, Google trends, right? So can you help the viewers and listeners who's listening via podcast can you give us some strategies on basically how to help us put our phone down? Literally, we need to just put our phone down at a certain time. I mean, really simply take this, mm -hmm. put it away from you and really sit with someone to have a conversation. And I think that lost that fine art of conversation and so social interaction has really been lost. And even if you're not married and you're dating, the thing I hear about people that are dating that's, is a challenge is like connecting with people, like really feeling like that person can have an intellectual con conversation with you mm -hmm. or that they could just be conversational. And part of that, I think, is because of this. I mean, it's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. to be able to look at social media, um, but we are also living our lives day to day. Right. And this, this is real, our life. And this is like a part of it, but it's not totally intertwined with our life. 
So I think just, you know, finding that balance of saying, okay, I'm going to like, because we, you and I are creators and it's true. We're always looking for things and things are like coming across. We're like, oh, and I know, I know if you're, I have a feeling you're like, oh, that's a good one. I got to make sure I save that, you know, talk about that with the, you know, the people that follow me or, you know, on my platform. But I think just having some cutoff times, like, okay, at this time each night, I'm going to shut down my, you know, I'm going to take my phone and put it away from me. And I think also people will find that they're a little more relaxed because each time we are engaging in social media, we know that it is tripping up our endorphins and our, you know, our, our, our cortisol levels, not less necessarily stressing us out, but just getting us a little more hyped. And sometimes that's why we're fidgety too at night. So it's not just good for your relationships. It's actually good for your mental uh, well-being as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree because there was a time when I had a, a analog, uh, I don't know if you call it analog clock, a little digital clock I had in my room. And this was probably about two years ago. And I kept my phone in the kitchen and I would wake up to my alarm clock instead of having my phone in the room. And it's just always that wanting to check when you have your phone in a room, right. especially if you're using it for an alarm, it's just like, okay. It's, it's automatic. And another thing I do is like, I don't allow notifications. Like you can shut down notifications. And I think that helps a lot because it almost teaches you to break up your concentration. We don't talk about that enough, which is changing the way our brain is constructed. Um, because it's like, you think you're multitasking well, but you really aren't. You're kind of throwing your brain out of concentration mode and focus, which I think is impacting some of the quality of our relationships and our ability to stay focused. And I, as I'm saying this, I'm talking to you guys, but I'm talking to me too, because this is something I struggle with. It's like, we're so used to seeing something in 30 seconds or a minute or 10 seconds, and it, it doesn't capture our attention. We go on to the next thing. And I think that's happening in real life, which is why sometimes we're even sitting in front of someone and listening, it's easy to miss things because it's just like our minds are being trained a bit to just not stay engaged, you know, uh, or to move on if we're bored. So I think that's complicating some of our relationships and our ability to connect to people. Mm, that's good. And I think it, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it also affects people uh, eye to eye contact. I've noticed people really don't look at people. Yes. yes. You know, and, and I guess I'm telling, you know, I'm 46, so I'm telling my age, but <laughs> <laughs> we were always taught that you look someone in the eye when you're talking yeah. to them. And nowadays it's like people, they'll look at you for two seconds and then they're off. And then maybe they'll come back maybe a minute later, but it's almost as if people are looking. I don't know if that has anything to do with our phones. I don't know. No, you might be onto something because you're, you're right. Like a lot, sometimes if you just observe surroundings and my husband's really great at this so that's why he, he balances me out really well I kind of turned him on to social media he was not really even looking at social media he's not obsessed with it he knows how to balance it more but one thing he would just be like look around you like look up and I, I think about when you're in a room or you're in a restaurant or you're somewhere and you're looking at people most people are like this so we are conditioning ourselves to look down and you're right I, I grew up like that too where it was like hey when you're talking to someone, you look them in the eye, you make eye contact. And, and unfortunately, I feel like some of that is being lost a little bit. Um, and it's something about eye contact. Like if I'm looking at you and you think I'm looking at you and you feel that you feel like I'm hearing you and I'm communicating with you. But if I'm like this, it could feel like I'm not really connecting with you or hearing you or listening to you or respecting, you know, what you have to say. So there's value in this, uh, in us building, you know, just healthier relationships in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's one last thing I want to ask about this. How do you feel about when people are on dates, especially on first dates, right? Do you think people should just keep their phones in a car or do you think it's inappropriate to like be on your phone on the first I date? I think like keeping your phone on you is okay because maybe that date may go wrong or you something may come up just for a safety perspective. Like maybe you are going to meet someone for the first time and you want your family or, or someone to know where you're at. And so you're, you know, you're just kind of keeping that phone there just to be gotcha. safe. I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I do think, yes, you should put it away. Like it should not be something that's part of that date. It shouldn't be like a date of four, <laughs> your two <laughs> phones and the two people it should be a date of two with your phones put away. So I think there is value because um, I know like talking to a lot of people that I coach that online dating is exhausting people because there's such a pressure. Like I think 
first you're texting, then, you know, you're, you're corresponding with the person. Then you finally get to go on a date and there's so much pressure for the, you to feel some connection or something like that. So people have lost even a sense of like how it takes time to build that connection. So I think like removing other things like a phone in that instance can give you a better sense of like, okay, do I feel that this person can socialize with me? Do I feel like I can socialize with them? And it, it teaches you to be a better conversationalist, which I think helps you to get to the right person, you know, a, a who connects with you on that level. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Put it away it could be a really good way to just date more with intention, right? And, and more awareness of both parties, yourself and the other person. Mm -hmm. I agree. I wanted to, I want to speak to you about get back culture. <laughs> And, and how is it shaking up relationships? Can you explain get back culture? I think one thing that really frustrates me while I was really happy to see your content, Scary to Remarry, is that you don't just focus on one side of the equation. And I've been told this like for many years as a relationship coach, Elizabeth, you need to just focus on women or men. But my argument has always been that it takes men and women to have a relationship and there's accountability that should be shared on both sides. So when I was doing a video on get back culture, what I'm observing is that everything, not everything, but many things that are out there and, and promoted around relationships is very one sided and one dimensional. And what I mean by that is like it'll say, hey, you, you know, women don't trust men because of this. And I'll post it because I want to see like what do women think. But then I challenge people to say when we think about trust, it involves two people. So if we're being honest, trust is not so much always about gender, but it's about people and their, you know, their personalities, their qualities, their moral compass. And so I want people to get off of like, is this person's fault all the time? But I'm more I want them to focus more on themselves first, because that's the foundation of the relationships they're going into. And then secondly, of course, you're going to look at the other person. That's a no brainer. But I think what happens is a lot of times is more like I see blame, you know, like all men do this, all women do this. Men don't understand me in this way. Women don't understand me in that way. And there's so much like infighting and angst that there's not communication happening on both sides, but both sides are feeling similar things. And, I, and I'm so fortunate because I get to coach men and women. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I hear similar things from men, just like I hear from women. I want someone who can intellectually stimulate me. I hear that from men and women. I want someone I can trust. I hear that from men and women. I want someone that like, if they're loyal, you know, if I'm loyal to them, they're not going to like take advantage of that or take that loyalty or kindness for weakness. Um, I want someone I could be in a committed relationship with. And I think sometimes why we get bitter or frustrated in relationships, you know, is because it's on us a lot of times when we look back, when we really get more maturity around how we choose people and we look back we realize we had a lot more control of those situations and we were often choosing people who weren't compatible or who weren't suitable or mature but we were hoping to make them what we wanted and that's the conversation I think people that's why I want to get to the self-accountability because it's like when you look at it there's a pattern to how we date and we just have dating blind spots and relationship blind spots even you and I are married and we know like even in a marriage there's, you, you constantly are working on certain things together and separately. So there's the interdependence and the independent part, right, of that relationship that you have to cohesively come together and meld things together. So I, that's the get back culture. And I, and, I, and I always joke, like the get back culture is like people not willing to just sit there and hear people without being defensive. So that's the other part of it. Like own your stuff. If you're hearing a pattern of three, three is always my variable, three or more times you're hearing, you know what, you're a little cold or you need to be a little less selfish or you're not communicating well. Those are areas of opportunity for you to develop those areas. But in the get back culture is like, oh, I ain't communicating. I'm going to tell you what you're not doing. And then what does that lead to just a cycle of toxic relationships? Because number one, you're never dealing with the issues that could be keeping you from being with the person you want or deserve. Mm -hmm. And then number two, you're, you're making excuses and you're not like accepting things that can actually make you better as a person. So I think there is some truth in constructive criticism. And I think there is also um, the, the willingness to be humble and, and listen at least and receive as opposed to immediately jumping in to defend. I think that kills a lot of relationships. Mm -hmm. I agree because the defensiveness is 
it's a killer. Um, Dr. John Gottman talks about defensiveness a lot. So and how it takes it takes couples in this cycle. Um, it's like the four horsemen. I think yes. how people like stonewall or they get defensive. Mm-hmm. And so eventually over time, it just shuts down the communication. And then that's what causes the relationship to people to grow apart because it's just like, I can't talk to you. I can't express how I feel to you without you, you know, coming in and like not accepting it or having a reason or rationale each time. And it's not to say like, sometimes I feel, I have, a, it's a saying, sometimes you're right. Sometimes your partner's right. Sometimes you're both right. Sometimes you're both wrong. <laughs> so the so truth is always somewhere in between, but there is usually truth in what people are saying, especially if it's something that consistently, you know, are expressing to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because there's a, there's times I know in my last marriage, I was really defensive. Mm-hmm. And I know that's one of the reasons that led to the divide, demise of my marriage because I that just wasn't I, I wasn't good with accepting criticism. And now that I'm I'm more mature, I'm learning now this time around. Like, mm-hmm. listen, like you said, there could be some truth. Take some time to listen and and hold yourself accountable and be okay with that. And you get to change that dance too. It's the dance that the, the same thing that just keeps happening and happening. So who's going to break the dance? Who's going to do create right. a new step? You know, that whole kind of thing. But you never really can get to another level in your relationship if it's the same thing over and yeah. over. I love what you said. Cause like, this is my second marriage. I, I'm going to be very, you know, open and honest with your audience. I've been single. I've been, you know, married before I dated a single parent, Um, I've been through it all. You know, I've been in long term relationships and then I remarried and there was a lot I had to learn about myself. That's why I'm very passionate. Like I know sometimes I feel like I can't shut up when people ask me questions about this stuff. But it's like I'm just I don't want people to go through the learning curve I had to go through because it's like unnecessary pain. Um, I just think there's so much value in just like building self-awareness or getting the help you need to build the self-awareness, breaking generational curses that exist in a lot of families um, of unhealthy relationships and toxic relationship behaviors, breaking them in yourself. There's just such a power in that. And so that's why I really focus on people first having self-accountability, the self-love. And everyone wants to talk about the pretty parts of self-love, but there's a lot of ugly, like there's the shadow side, the shadow work you have to do, meaning the things you have to develop awareness around where you know it's a challenge for you. So for me, I used to be the person that'd be like, well, I don't know why this isn't working. And I was just not picking I was not making good decisions. Let's just say this. This is no knock against anyone I dated, but I just wasn't picking, deci- making decisions to pick people to give me what I know I wanted and needed. I was making excuses for it. I was not, you know, open to exploring, uh, just, you know, thinking about like, okay, this is not, you know, you've been down this road, but you keep doing this. Like I had to break those behaviors. Um, I was an avoidant person. I didn't, when, you know, when I had a di- disagreement, I just would like shut down, go within myself. I had to come to a recognition that that does not help. It's not healthy because it stays here and it builds up and it comes out in different ways. So I just think, I love what you said about like, look, I didn't like to hear criticism because no one does. No one wants anyone to like tell them they're doing something wrong. Like that's just human nature. But when you can receive it and then when you learn to communicate it in a loving way, that is a totally different relationship. So you probably like feel now like, wow, I get it now. There's some things now that I just, I don't take it to heart as much because it's going to help our relationship be better. So I think looking at it from the lens of making you to be, helping you to be a better person than helping the relationship to be better is the lens to look at it from. And if you kind of approach it that way, you'll see the quality of your you know communication will improve and you'll you'll see that you could actually work through these situations and come back and rebound as a couple and not like tear each other up. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when you're having these discussions on touchy topics that aren't comfortable to talk about. Yes. Yes. Because Lord knows I've had those uncomfortable conversations. (laughs) No, (laughs) It's like, (laughs) you know, especially when it's, when it's about you, but I realized too, I realized too, that when you allow your significant other or your spouse to say what they need to say, if you accept it, instead of being defensive or reflective, you unarm the conversation. That's true. That's true. You know, because now they said what they had to say and because they ready. They they, ready. They, yeah. low. they, they yeah. you know, they, they know what they can say about you. Mm-hmm. And if you accept it and you're like, you know what, that's the area I need to tighten up in. That's the area that I need to do better in. I'm sorry. They oh, stuck yeah. there like, 
Right. <laughs> well, because I think what happens in our relationships, the reason A, we hold things back or B, we avoid or C, we're defensive is maybe, you know, we had situations where we felt like we couldn't communicate or it escalated so much to a level it made us, you know, completely uncomfortable. Or maybe some people grew up in homes where they saw very violent situations with their parents or caregivers um, who didn't know how to manage conflict resolution, right? So whenever it happens, for some people, it's literally a trauma response to like go within themselves or a trauma response to be like, I'm gone. I'm I'm not, I'm, I'm just, I don't want to talk anymore. Or for some people who are used to fighting or seeing that fighting to fight. So that's why when you, you're right, when someone's telling you something and you just sit there and say, okay, it's like, that's the first level of it coming down because mm -hmm. people kind of, they do have a play of how they think an argument's going to play out. And when it doesn't, it's like foreign to them at first. And then sometimes they're like, what's wrong with you? Do you love me? Because they're used to fighting a different way. And then they get to a point, they're like, wait a minute, this feels kind of good to like have a healthy, uh, you know, to have healthy friction, I call it, or a, a, a disagreement, but to still walk away feeling like we're good. Mm -hmm. Like we don't agree on that, but we can figure that out. Or we may not figure that out. We may agree to angry. We may disagree. We may reach an uh, impasse. Mm -hmm. So I, I think all of that is um, just valuable to help the relationship to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Because I tell my clients too, that they're like why they don't listen to me or why are they not responding to me or why they feel like they have to walk on eggshells they won't tell me anything and i say because that's the dance that you've created you have trained your spouse or significant other to respond to you in that way so they are already locked and loaded in what they want to say or they used to shutting down because that's how you trained your communication i wanted to speak to you about there was a post that you had on Twitter that I love. You said this in reference to long-term relationships. Even though you love your significant other, you may still wonder at times if there is someone better out there. The grass may seem greener, but everyone has weeds in their grass. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah, I, you know, man, I, I've been having some really interesting, you know, I never divulge like who my clients are or anything like that, but I think we can learn from some of these scenarios. But I think there are people that sometimes get in relationships and then actually the relationship is going well, but to them, well, is boring because we are taught to look for excitement and sparks. And that does exist in a relationship. But I do think sometimes you get to a point where it could be pretty much like you're like going through your emotions and it's, it just feels good. There's nothing bad happening or jarring, but there's nothing exciting happening. And that's where you have to kind of find ways to constantly reconnect, create that, you know, that connection with your partner, um, do do new things together and so forth. But I think there are trends. There are trends of people moving towards polyamorous relationships. There are trends of people having open marriages. Um, there are trends of people being like, you know what, this person over here, I just feel like I connect with them. Like I talk to them and they may not mean for it to happen, but then over time they build this, you know, camaraderie or this relationship with them emotionally. And they're like, I think this is better. But then what we've seen, like, you know, it's interesting if you look at first marriage statistics, I'm sure you looked at this, like 50% of first marriages end in divorce, right? When it gets to second marriage, it gets up to like 66%, I think, mm -hmm. or 67% mm -hmm. end in divorce. Then when it gets to the third, I think it's at like 75%. So what that tells me is that people... And I think too, no judgment on like marriage and divorce, because sometimes we just, we think something is one thing you get in it is something else that happens. Um, sometimes you really try, but it's just, it's not a good, you know, relationship to be in. So I'm not knocking those scenarios, but I think what I am asking people to think about is like, sometimes we think, okay, it's going to get better. And then people go to the, what they think is better, but then there's something else they didn't anticipate would come with that situation. So I just think you have to be realistic and know that no matter who you're with, even when you love someone and you're into them, there's just going to be difficult or challenging moments in every relationship. And I don't think we talk about that enough on social media. We see, I always say the highlights of people's life, we don't see the low lights too much. Mm -hmm. um, and the low lights, meaning the more difficult, challenging periods, we see more like, oh, we're in this wonderful vacation but we don't see what may have happened before they took that picture or after they took that picture. It's like a snapshot in time and, 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 you know, just a moment in time. And I think we grab onto these images and we grab onto like what we feel 
or sense or think a relationship would be, but the reality is a relationship would be beautiful. It could be boring. It could be murky at times. It could be all of those things because that's a relationship. You're on this ship with this person. They got their cargo. You got your cargo. And sometimes that cargo is colliding. Sometimes that ship is lopsided. Sometimes those you're on turbulent waters and sometimes you're like just sailing, smooth sailing. Everything is great. So I, I just, you know, because I, I, I remember having these conversations with um, some friends of mine and sometimes they would say things like, well, my, you know, this other person's doing all these things for me. And I said, well, they're not dealing with your day to day. That might feel appealing because there's limited exposure. If you're just going to have fun with someone for a moment, that's going to feel more exciting. But if you take away what you have and then like you go there and you're there more consistently, there's going to be things you identify that you're like, oh, I don't know if I like this or I don't know if this is my thing because that's just human nature. So long story short, I just encourage people to realize like there's always going to be something um, that you're dealing with, you know, regard, you know, regardless of who you were with or, you know, how it may appear initially. Mm hmm. Yeah, because people, we all have our stuff, right? We all have, you know, our little baggage. Some people have sandwich bag size issues. Some people have garbage bag size issues. I love that. I love yeah. that. I've heard that one. That's good. <laughs> yeah, it just depends on what you're willing to carry uh, or at least help carry. How do you feel? And this is not in my notes. And as I heard you talk, so I want I wanted to know. So this is like uncut. How do you feel about polyamorous relationships? And the reason I asked you is because there was, I don't, somebody famous said it. I can't remember, but they were saying that because there's so many lack of quote unquote good men, that it's almost better that you be in a polyam poly, polyamorous relationship, if that's the correct term. That way the kids have a covering. Uh, they have a man. They have uh, stability and all these other different things. And I'm just kind of taking pieces of that, but yeah. like, how do you feel about that whole narrative? So I feel like when people come to me and they talk about opening up their relationship, that the first thing I say was what's going on in your relationship? Like, why, why do you want to open up your relationship? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when I dig beneath the surface and they dig beneath the surface, it's not that they may make a decision to go, you know, say yes or no, but a lot of times it's things they're not dealing with within the relationship. So I feel like the open relationship thing, number one, like, are you doing it because this is just you saying, hey, I really don't want to be tied down. I don't want to be committed. And I this is the only way I can be in a relationship because you're kind of wanting the benefits of it, of a relationship, but you're involving multiple people. So it's like, that's one piece of it. Number two, people struggle with themselves, like with two people. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not saying one way is better or not, but now you're going to bring in another person, then another person. Now you're going to bring in children. Um, you know, when we think about kids and our lineage, the only thing I would say to people on it is like, I know you think this could be good for your kids because some people do have these relationships and they feel like it works for them, but you are setting a precedent. So like we as adults, we, the way we govern our lives is based on how we observe, how we're raised um, you know, consciously and subconsciously. So now you're teaching your kids a new way of being. And then I think about this part, realistically, can you really accommodate all these children? So we won't name celebrities that have had 10, 11 children by 11 different moms. A lot of people argue it doesn't matter. Like, you know, this person has money, they're taking care of them. But yeah, they're, they may be taking care of them financially, but are they taking care of their kids on other levels, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually? Um, are they teaching them, you know, what are they teaching their children? How can they even teach their children? Because you got to divide up a day, right? So 24 hours in a day, we sleep eight to 10, and 10 if you're really lucky. Uh, we work another eight. Sometimes some of us are working more than eight hours. And then we have other duties outside of that. So that's already like 16 hours. That's above 24 hours, okay, right? When you add the 16 and 10 is 26. So that's above 24 hours. But now you're saying, no, I can have this other relationship. I can have these other children. It'll be fine. They'll, they'll, they'll be great because at least they see a, a, a relationship. How much time realistically, if you're managing that and taking care of multiple parents, multiple families, are you really going to be able to give those kids what they need? I think I would be very interested to interview kids that grew up in polyamorous homes to see what their opinion of it is. And it probably would be kids on both sides of it. Mm -hmm. But I would bet there's some kids that felt like they actually didn't get 
the time they would have wanted with those parents. Because I think about myself as a parent with my, you know, and I, I, I co-parented with my ex-husband pretty successfully, mm -hmm. but I think about how my daughter's still like, I wish I had more time. I wish I had this. And I, we only had each other. And at times I was a single parent struggling, right. Mm -hmm. To make up that time. So now we're saying, okay, say I was, you know, married at the time again, most of her life, cause I was married the first part of her life and then divorced the second part, mm -hmm. but say I had that. And then now there's another guy and some other people, even though I would have brought this male figure in, it still would have been the same complaint, I think, from her because he would have had to divide time between uh, more than one family. So I don't think there's a short answer to it. I think people have different reasons. They're justifying it now. I think some people kind of want both ends of it. And I think people just need to say that. And if they're saying that and people are okay with that, fine. But what I do find sometimes is, is that people have talked one party into it. And maybe that party went into it initially but as they saw what it was, they really, at first it was fine. And but then over time, they're like, no, I don't think I want this set up. Mm -hmm. So I think there's so many factors uh, to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. and, and jealousy is real. Oh, yeah. 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 Jealousy is real. Yeah. I know a lot of times people say they can they can cut off their feelings. I can mm -hmm. turn my feelings off. And I, yeah, but we're all human. You will run into that right person who you really like and yeah, I don't know if you that's, can the clear, that's the thing I think we don't talk about, like with the open relationship thing, like people are like, I can keep it outside the home. I can do this. You know, I could do this outside the house. But I also feel like there's a spiritual piece to this. Like when you do things out of order, it creates chaos. I know we may try to justify it from different from different reasons. I know this is not going to be a popular opinion, but when you do things out of order, there are things that result. So like if people are spiritual that are watching this, like I think about Sarah and Abraham and how she got so desperate to give him a child. She was like, okay, you can go lay with this concubine and have this child. So then I think that was Ishmael, right? That came out of that union with the concubine and Abraham. But then you can see that was the beginning of open, kind of open relationships. I'm sure there were others, but one that we were told a lot about. And she had resentment toward that child. She had resentment toward that concubine. She sent that concubine away because there was a discomfort in this woman being there and this child that reminded her of Abraham, right? And he loved his son and he, he was divided. I'm sure the whole time it was like, but you told me to do this. You said it would be okay. <laughs> Yeah, right. but then in the end it wasn't and then when she had her own child she's like forget this you gotta go yep. and so and then god intervened and said okay you know what this child came through abraham's lineage so i'm gonna still give this child some blessings but i think that's the division and rift we see of the history of how some of these relationships started thinking like okay we could do this we can kind of create our own value system of how we're going to have our relationship but then in the end the results are like Marital strife, uh, division of rifts in the family. Um, are, you know, you know there were some arguments going on because Abraham probably felt very divided, but yet he was told <laughs> to go do it. Nice. And you sure, and I'm sure Sarah was also emotionally frustrated because she was trying to do the right thing. Because during that time, a woman having a child was a big deal. That's mm -hmm. that was a, lo a large part of a woman's worth. Mm -hmm. um, so, but in the end, it was it was out of order, and it continued to create contention. And Ishmael knew he wasn't loved by Sarah. So, so it's just, it's interesting, but like, if you look at things historically, it kind of gives you a reference point of how people get ideas, I think, and then how the same things are happening. It's just different times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if you even looking throughout the Bible and I tell people that the people are like, yeah, in biblical times, they had a bunch of wives and all this other stuff to try to justify it with that. But I'm like, give me one healthy marriage. <laughs> From any of those <laughs> relationships. So a lot to go on and on, but like David's another example of that. In David, Bishop. right? And then if people are like, well, I, you know, I, I could take you from Bible to re to the to natural. So I'm going to take people from the Bible to natural. Mm -hmm. So David's an example of that with Bathsheba. He tried to cover that up and there was strife, murder, all kind of stuff happened that affected his lineage. So like when we're doing actions, even if you look at your legacy, it's in them. And they sometimes don't even know why it's in them because you have practiced certain things and that's that it carries to generations. They they talk about even like people who've been affected by slavery through lineage, lineage still have trauma, which is why they you may be around somebody or something, sense something and react to them because it's literally in your DNA. Now, let's fast forward because people are going to say, oh, bit Bible, Bible. OK, one more example, Solomon, he had 
as many women as he wanted, his little heart could desire. I think he had 700, 700? Over 700 women. Um, <laughs> so like, but this was the wisest man, okay? God had given him the most wisdom. And he still, he's at the end of the day, he's like, none of this stuff matters. Material things, sex. I mean, he pretty much said it in so many words. But then people will say, okay, that's Bible. I don't believe in that. Okay, I'll talk about Will Chamberlain. I'm a sports <laughs> fan. I've been watching Goliath. It's really interesting. Um, Will Chamberlain, he slept with over 20,000 women. And then he said, like, it always gets talked about that I slept with over 20,000 women. But he's like, I wish I could have slept with one woman a thousand times. That would have been more meaningful to me, which I think is interesting because he had, he knew he wanted to be single. He knew he didn't want to be committed. So for him, that may have been the right track. But even though he had 20,000 women and we know basketball star, successful, he had every woman he probably could desire. He still, it didn't still feel like his heart in the end. And I, and I thought that was interesting, but he's like, my legacy is kind of overshadowed by this statistic, yeah. <laughs> you know, even though he had other amazing statistics in basketball. So yeah. I, so you have examples spiritually and you have examples in the natural of people. And then we could just look around us at people and see how people constantly try these things and they still have marriages that don't work. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. And, and that's, that's a show within itself. I, <laughs> we can start. Sorry, I, I just had to like say that because it's like, I mean, <laughs> I just feel like people need to have, I think there's multiple sides to this conversation. So I don't want to say I know all the things about it, but I just want people to look at it from like a historical reference. And it just depends on what you want. Do you want to be, in a relationship with someone, you know, and do you really want a healthy relationship? And if you look at things historically, they can give you a great reference point of what doesn't work and what does work. So you don't have to keep, you don't, you don't have to be the person making those mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I hear, uh, uh, you know, I hear women say, well, you talk about you want another woman. Can we have, can I have another man then? If that's yeah, the case, you guys yeah. like, uh, no, that's a different story. Just, right. That's always the thing that gets me. Like when you, because I mean, I've, I've peeked at one of these, some of these shows because like I'm a relationship coach, guys. I'm curious. I'm like, why are people doing this? I'm going to watch and see for a minute. And it is interesting if it flips. It's like, no, no, no. We don't need to do it that way. We need to do it this way, which is another sign. It's like one way. So it's not even equal or parity in the process. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I want to, I wanted to speak to you about but let's talk about your book. Okay. Uh, Love You and He Will Too. Can you, great title, by the way. Thank yeah. you, thank you, yeah. Great title. Can you can you talk about that? Yeah, so I that book is um, really helping people um, create a roadmap for happy and healthy relationships. And I, I just feel like, again, there's a lot of fluff out here. And when you sometimes listen to some of the advice, no, not because there's some great relationship coaches out there like you, but some of the advice you could tell people haven't been there yet or had the experience. So that book is really a journey through you connecting back with yourself first, with you really understanding who you are, building self-awareness, um, just understanding like your blind spots, you know, doing an inventory of your relationships, you know, to understand like, okay, where are my, my gaps? And, and, and really looking at those, honestly, looking at how you were raised, looking at your, you know, the things that affected you that you may not even think about. Cause when I coach people, there's a lot of things that are like, oh my God, I didn't draw that parallel. Cause the hardest person to see is yourself. Cause you're, you're close to yourself. Right. And you've probably been through this as a coach too. It's like, you talk to people and you can see things because either you've experienced it or it's just easier to be, to, it's, it's like giving a friend advice. It's just easier to give a friend advice because you're not in that situation. But then when it's you, you're just stuck. You're like, I don't see an answer. Um, so that book is really just about people getting answers and ideas around like who they are and what they want in a relationship, being realistic about what they want in a relationship and coming up with a game plan. And then I have a second book that's coming out soon. Um, it's called Love is Love Can Be Messy, But You Don't Have to Be. Mm. So that one's really deeper for like individuals and couples, things they can do to um, really create connection with each other, um, really roadmap how to get through conflict, things, things that we don't always talk about, um, really going more deeper into like some of the things that happen in a marriage and how to navigate those things. And then even if you're single, how to navigate being single and getting to a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay, let's let's jump into the bonus round. Now, these questions, 
There's no right or wrong answer. It's What's just... excitement. You're like, yeah, real excited. Like, okay, let's get past this to the bonus. Oh, well, <laughs> well, because I, I, I don't want to give away too much of the book. And and by the way, I want to make sure that the people get your books. I want to leave uh, in the description below. I'll make sure I leave that below where people can purchase your book. And are you accepting pre-orders now for the book or? But not yet, but probably towards like the end of the year or early next year, I'll start putting some pre-orders up on my uh, website. So just if people go to elizabethoverstreet.com, they can sign up for my mailing list. And then when that time comes, they'll be alerted about the new book. Oh, okay. Awesome. And then make sure that I stay connected with you as well. So I can help support that as well. Thanks. Um, you know, as fellow authors, I get it. <laughs> it's blood, sweat, and tears, guys. You have no idea. It's long <laughs> thoughts of writing. You're just like, <laughs> and very supportive spouses because they're like, okay, you're going to your writing cave again. <laughs> I know, right? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll have author talk off, off the, okay. Uh, okay. yeah, and I'll get started and we'll, <laughs> we'll show them switch. <laughs> Bonus round. What is the biggest mistake you what is the biggest mistake you see women make in relationships? Mm, I think misunderstanding the intention of men. So I, I feel like um, a lot of times a man is communicating to a woman a certain way or showing her certain actions and a woman will perceive what he's doing based on her experiences or her hurt um, versus leaning into curiosity and asking the man. And I have so many examples of that, <laughs> but just like, you know, a guy is doing the gesture. What's he doing? What's, what is this about? There, there could be like almost a um, hesitancy, hesitancy to accept it or almost a doubting of that behavior because it's not something they're used to. So it could be them actually missing out on seeing something that's actually a good gesture, a healthy gesture, but because of conditioning and experiences with relationships that weren't great, they don't see it or read it that way. Yeah, and I've I've heard that before, and I, yeah, I've even known women who they look back and they say that very thing. Mm -hmm. you know, they look back over their life and they're like, "Oh my God!" You know, <laughs> get that revelation from seeing your parents' relationship. What did it teach you about marriage? Ooh, so I I left this out in the beginning. Um, my I'm so fortunate because I come from a lot to multi decade. Uh, marital relationships that I was able to observe. So I think the signal I was getting as a kid and as a young adult was like, this is going to be easy because my parents, they were together 57 years, grandparents, 60 years, aunts and uncles, 40 plus years. And so everyone that got married, st got married, stayed together. Um, and, but I think what my parents taught me is just the value of partnership. Like they really had each other's back. And I saw my mom and dad both go through ups and downs together, but like they never gave up on each other. Um, they always supported each other. They had very strong spiritual beliefs, which I think helped them because sometimes you need something bigger <laughs> than just the two of you. Yes. Um, I watched them pray together each day. They would discuss scripture together each day. Um, they would, um, when they had conflict, sometimes they get a little heated, but they never, there was never any violence. Um, they would take it to the room. So they were teaching us like, yeah, there's conflict here. You're <laughs> hearing parts of it, but we're resolving it. And I would see love on the other side of the conflict. So like, I never saw where, you know, my dad just left the house and didn't come back or my dad stayed on the couch, little things. He didn't stay on the couch. He was always in the bedroom with my mom. Like, so all of those things were modeling to me, like, okay, you can fight, but still love each other. You can disagree, but come back and resolve things. Um, you can, you know, you, you can um, have bad times, but you can have really good times and you can still get through the bad times when you learn how to use the partnership to pull on each other's strengths to get through those hard times. So they were just teaching me. I was just, I feel very fortunate. I saw that with my parents. I saw my grandparents, and like I said, aunts and uncles, and it wasn't always perfect. It was hard. Like, cause some people say, well, people stay married cause they had to, my parents have to stay married. And I would ask my mom, like, how do you get through this? Cause my dad had a strong personality and she would say a lot of faith, a lot of faith. <laughs> <laughs> So that was like the joke. And so like, and, you know, and sometimes I call my dad and be like, where's mom? He's like, she's out in the streets, but he didn't mean it that way. He just was like, she'd go and do her thing. So they knew how to like be interdependent, but also give each other space. So there's just a ton of things um, that I, I just feel really grateful growing up with both of them and having both of them just mm -hmm. show me such, you know, such love, you know, and leave such a love legacy, I always say. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, I love that. 
yeah, we need more of that. Yeah. Is it easier to love yourself or someone else? Ooh, I actually think someone else sometimes. Mm-hmm. I think that's why sometimes there's a disconnect in relationships because you, you'll you listen to people and they'll be like, I poured everything into this person. And then when it's themselves, they're harder on themselves or they may not give themselves that same like unconditional love that they would give someone else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how, how does that look in your own personal life? As far as the self-love versus the love in the relationship? Yeah, like like where where do you find yourself or like where did you get the revelation of, you know, like where where do you stand with that person? I think it's a pendulum. Like I think I'm always working on self-love because I'm very um, achievement oriented. I'm very self-critical mm-hmm. because I just, there's things I want to do and I feel like there's not enough time and I have this impatience toward doing these things. So I could be very hard on myself. Uh, but that, but I think I'm constantly learning how to give myself grace um, and just being quite transparent. Like this week was a rough week and I was like, I'm so tired and I don't know if I can get through it. But then we're talking tonight and I'm, re- you know, I'm remembering like, man, this is what I love doing is, is sharing with people about love. Like it really fills my cup. Um, so even in having those hard moments, it was funny. I was talking to my mentor and my mentor's like, you'll be fine. You got this. Cause I was like, I got to do an interview. I want to give good energy to Sean. <laughs> And my mom just pumping me up. You got this. You're going to do it. You need people like that in your corner too. But to answer your question, yeah, I think it's a, it's a pendulum swing of like, some you know, sometimes I'm doing a great job of self-love and sometimes I have to keep working at it. And I think I want people out there to know that like it's a continuous effort in relationships, in the relationship with yourself and others. It doesn't stop. It, it changes and shifts. And then I think there's times I'm putting more love into my, my husband. I think that happens too. Yeah. You know, and and sometimes I'm like, man, okay, where's my return? (laughs) No, I'm joking. I'm joking. He's, he's actually really good to me too, but it's like sometimes, but in a relationship, realistically, there are times you're like, man, okay, come on now. And, and 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 that's normal. Um, But I think what I'm learning to do is communicate. And and I would say to people out there, um, you know, women and men, like finding your voice and advocating, that's a part of being, of exercising self-love because you're acknowledging, I feel pain or I feel like I need this from you. So I'm being better about communicating to, you know, my needs uh, with my husband. And he, he does that with me too. And sometimes it's touchy topics and it's not always easy because we both have history of how we've had relationships and how that turns out. Right. Um, But we just continue to, to put one foot, you know, ahead of the other and keep working through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I get it. I totally agree. You know, we, like you said, that work in progress. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we need to normalize that, like a work in progress. Totally. A lot yeah. of times we talk about like healed, like I'm healed. And, and then people think they get in this relationship and they're like, I thought you said you were healed. This was <laughs> easy. Healing is continual. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. like, because, you know, my thing is like you change from your 20s to your 30s, to your 40s, to your 50s. Things are happening in your life that change who you are. So all of that, guess what, has an effect on the way you view yourself and the way you operate in your relationship. So you have to give yourself grace and know that some moments are going to be stickier than other moments. Wow. Well, Elizabeth, this has been a phenomenal episode. Let everyone know how they can get in touch with you, how they can buy your books, how they can get coaching, what you give us, all of that, all that good stuff. So um, people can visit my website at elizabethoverstreet.com. And it's just like it sounds, Overstreet. Yes, I was teased for that name back in the day when I was younger. (laughs) Everyone had the same corny joke. But yes, elizabethoverstreet.com. You could go there to learn more about me. Um, If you want to just sign up to book a consultation, I do talk to people initially just to see if it's a good fit. Um, If you want to sign up for like email alerts, my newsletter, you could do it there as well. All my social media channels are linked to that website as well. And I just thank you again, Sean, for having me um, on the show. And I'm glad you're you're talking to people a lot about <laughs> scary to remarry because that's real too. Because you do hear a lot of people saying, I just want to stay in my peace. I'm nervous about losing my peace. And that's real. So I think the work you're doing is super um, important too. Wow. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, because, and, and that's a whole show within itself right now mm-hmm. actually plan on doing a show a uh, four-part series maybe five it just depends on how many people i'm thinking about getting in but i want to talk about like life after divorce because going through that process you're like oh my god i can't believe i'm actually doing this right and, you know and you, you just 
so worried about tomorrow and and what that's going to look like for you financially and it is just like so much other stuff but there is life after divorce right um so that's something that i'm thinking about doing so anyway i guess i put it out there so people are probably going to inbox me and be like okay so what's going on with Please this do that show <laughs> right well there is i mean i've been through divorce before and it is really hard a uh, decision to make it's not easy and it's hard process to reset and rebuild and to take you know to have to do things you're not used to doing on your own again it, it is a lot to it but there is light at the end of the tunnel there's so much learning that comes out of it and um you get to know yourself again that's a part of it too that self-discovery and there's a way to do it the right way so i think that would be a great show to do mm, awesome awesome well i might be inboxing you sometime soon so <laughs> i might be on the show guys <laughs> Well, you heard it here, Bravehearts community. Elizabeth says she's going to come back. <laughs> I love how he just did that. <laughs> you heard it here. Well, if you are watching this via YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Make sure you share this with someone because you never know what someone is going through. So feel free to share this video with a friend. Um, even if it's in your group chat and you're talking to your girlfriends or your, your guy friends or something, share this video on your group chat so you can have a whole conversation based on that. I realize that's how you get more views. <laughs> um, if you are listening to this via podcast, make sure you leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts by doing so. It puts you in a drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Matter of fact, I think we have a winner. I have to announce that winner, but we'll talk about that during another time. But make sure you leave a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you. This is Sean Heineman with special guest Elizabeth Overstreet. <laughs> All right, Brave Arts community, take care. Hey, thanks again for watching another segment of A Scary to Remarry. I have so much more amazing content and some phenomenal guests as well. People who've been through a divorce, people who remarried, people who desire to marry. So much great content. So make sure that you hit one of these videos. It's somewhere around here, but anyway, go watch another video.